On to research updates. Um, so I'll, I'll just give a quick introduction to the panel of four. Um, so we've got some esteemed researchers here, as we always do, um, to take your questions about where, first we're going to start with an update on where is medical science, where is genetic research, where's everything else going, where and where do we see it going in the future, um, throw your questions at the Q&A. Um, I'll, I'll do a quick introduction of the four um, first, and then I'll throw it to um, Professor Grigg. Um, so, um, Dr. Uh, Elisa Cornish is a, a senior clinical lecturer at the University of Sydney. She's actively involved in ophthalmology registrar and medical student teaching and the inherited eye disease unit at the Safe Sight Institute, where she has a special interest in electrophysiology. Um, Professor John Grigg um, is the head uh, speciality of clinical ophthalmology and eye health at the University of Sydney. Um, he's the group leader of the eye genetics research unit at the Safe Sight Institute. His research interests are genetic eye disease, glaucoma management, and electrophysiology of the visual system. Professor Robin Jamison is the head discipline of genetic medicine and professor of genomic medicine at the University of Sydney. She leads the eye genetic research unit at the Children's Medical Research Unit and the Children's Hospital at Westmead and the Safe Side Institute. And finally, Associate Professor Matthew. Simunovic um, leads the retinal disease and rescue group at SafeSight. He's a consultant ophthalmic surgeon at Sydney Eye Hospital and the Sydney Children's Hospital Network. His research interests include emerging treatments for retinal diseases and experimental, oh, here we go. I was going so well with pronunciation, vitreo retinal surgery. Um, there we go. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll throw first to Professor Grigg. Um, Michael, thanks very much. Uh, I think we thought we'd just give a quick overview of a minute or so of each of what we're doing and then um, we really have an opportunity for questions from the, the audience. And so really, I suppose the, an update from us is that there's a, a lot of work going on for preparing for clinical trials for people with inherited retinal diseases, particularly understanding the natural history and improving uh, the phenotype to help with genetic testing. And uh, we have the clinical trials listed on the Safe Side Institute website and they're conducted across both the Safe Side Institute and the Children's Hospital Westmead. So with that brief overview, to, I'll hand over to the other panel members. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cornish. So I, I'm actually involved in the beginning end of that. I'm usually seeing patients at Safe Side Institute um, helping with their um, initial umbrella term of diagnosis, it might be a rod cone dystrophy or, you know, a macular dystrophy. And then after seeing the patients and chatting to them about their diagnosis, referring them to the clinical genetics team um, to find a genetic cause that's um, uh, participate, made their presentation the way it is. So that once we've got a genetic cause, then we can um, start looking for some of these uh, studies that are being run and get the patients involved if they wish to. Oh, yeah. So um, my name is Matthew Samarich. I'm, uh, as we heard e earlier on, I'm an academic at SafeSide Institute and I'm a vitro retinal surgeon. So I share interests in common with other members in, in the unit with whom I work uh, with closely. Um, uh, my interests sort of span from doing uh, laboratory research. So uh, my group's working on um, an approach called optogenetics, which is like a biological equivalent of the retinal implant, if you will. Uh, we're also looking at harnessing retinal explants as a possible source of retinal progenitor cells, which could be used in the future for, for, for therapy. Um, we're interested in exploring um, different approaches to delivering drugs underneath the retina. And this is one of the key approaches in retinal gene therapy, which uh, John and Lise touched on earlier. Um, I'm also interested in an approach called psychophysics, which um, is a, a broad approach whereby you assess visual function um, by garnering a response from a subject. So this ranges from really common tests like visual acuity, 
uh, through to um, visual field testing and, so, and some more arcane tests. And we're looking at developing sort of um, new approaches to psychophysics uh, to act as biomarkers or means of tracking um, both the natural history of retinal disease as well as new treatments. And finally, I've been working with other members in the unit, including um, John uh, Grigg, that is, and uh, Mark Gillies on developing a, um, a disease registry for patients with inherited retinal disease. And that should be built up quite shortly and rolled out later on in the year. Thank you. And uh, Professor Jamison. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, great to be here. Sorry we can't all be in person, but it's lovely that so many of you could join. Um, so um, I'm the head of the iGenetics Research Unit um, at uh, Children's Medical Research Institute, um, Sydney Children's Hospital Network, and also Safe Site Institute. And we're particularly interested uh, in the, finding the genetic uh, answers um, for people so that um, they can then um, have these uh, new genetic therapies that are coming along. Um, and we have teamed up um, now with the ophthalmology team uh, and the laboratory science team so that we can offer a virtual um, service uh, to understanding those genetic causes more. Um, because uh, up until now, there's been a few problems for um, people getting that sort of genetic testing. Now that's becoming a, a bit more available. Um, and then uh, there can be difficulties in interpretation of that testing. So we have a multidisciplinary team approach to that to find the answers. Um, and then in, labor in the laboratory, um, my team is also working on developing novel genetic therapies uh, for those conditions. You might have heard of gene editing, uh, CRISPR, um, and gene therapy replacement strategies. Uh, so that's uh, what we're working on. Uh, and we use um, induced pluripotent stem cells uh, from a person's blood, turned into stem cells, turned into little eyes in a dish, retinal organoids, uh, they're called, uh, and we can test the novel therapies on that. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of research and excitement happening. Uh, and I think there's uh, great ways forward now towards potential therapies uh, in a lot of these conditions. Lots going on. Um, now, we have got some questions that have come in. So uh, let me just try if we do a bit of pinning of everybody so uh, everyone can appear together. Let's see. I think Janet can probably do some magic. Um, now, the first question is, um, are there any updates on visual snow research and treatment? I think we can, uh, this is work that's actually done by Associate Professor Claire Fraser at Save Site, and she's been working in that and looking at uh, trying to define the condition and then looking at sort of what is the underlying etiology. And that's still a struggle, but it does seem that there may be challenges where the signals going from each eye arrive at the visual centers of the brain just slightly out of sync. And that's one of the hypotheses, but there's uh, a lot of work going on with, between herself and uh, Professor Paul Martin at SaveSide and also a group in London. Excellent. Um, next area, BBS research and treatment. Do we have any updates in that space? Uh, BBS, uh, Bardet Beetle syndrome. Um, so, uh, uh, so in terms of um, genetic diagnostics, I certainly think um, there are plenty of um, opportunities there now. There's lots of genes identified for those conditions. Uh, in terms of clinical trials, there have been uh, clinical trials in some of those. So BBS, it's not just one gene. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a number of different genes. Um, so there has been at least one uh, that I'm aware of there, where there's been um, clinical trials um, happening. Uh, not sure of the data through on that as yet. Um, I think we're still waiting to see how that's going. Yeah, the, the only one that I know of um, in addition is sort of re, repurposing of a medication called metformin, um, which is used typically for diabetes mellitus and um, might improve photoreceptor function uh, in patients uh, with Bardet-Biedl syndrome. And this is 
um, borne out by some uh, studies, natural history studies conducted at the University of Cubing. And I think they're still enrolling that I think the enrollment can uh, commenced a couple of years ago. I haven't seen any of the results. Right. Um, now, where were we? Uh, uh, RP research and treatments. So there's plenty of activity in the RP research and treatment space. Um, so uh, there's, uh, there's multiple um, studies going on around the world to understand both. I mean, RP, again, is a lot of genes. So there's over 60 different genes for, for RP. Uh, and so there would be research uh, in, in pretty much all of those, I would say. Um, and that's understanding the function uh, and then also various um, clinical trials are happening in that space um, for various of those genes. So there's um, there's a number of different genes um, where there's a lot of activity in that space. I guess to be more specific, we need to, I guess we need to know what the gene is, I guess. And I guess also the reassurance that um, our research team is always approached from the clinical trials that get set up for each of them as a, an international participant. So. No one's going to miss out because we live in Australia when stuff's happening elsewhere. So we're, we're all involved in um, the new studies that are coming out. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're well set up in, in Sydney because of, you know, all of the hard work uh, that's been done over the years, um, particularly by um, Robin and, and John in sort of phenotyping and genotyping patients. Um, but also Australia happily is an attractive place to run clinical trials um, because tax incentives. And, and it's the current world situation, which everyone's obviously aware of, has put us all in Zoom. Does that actually make research more difficult or does it uh, give you more time to spend on research? I think a little bit of both. Unfortunately, we can't. And if you're homeschooling. <laughs> 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 there's pluses and minuses so there's there has been a little bit of difficulty um in in the laboratory uh research um just because there's been uh you know tricky things in terms of um access to laboratories and you know who's an essential worker and so on and so forth um but by and large i think we've mostly been able to keep things going so Right. Um, I've got two other questions already. Um, the future of eye plants. Uh, Roy, do you want to comment on, on where are eye implants going? Where are they going to take us? I suppose that's re re referring to the bionic eye. And um, that's in a state of flux. There, there is good work being done in Melbourne with, uh, and they're up to a sort of a phase one study. They had a, a trial of three people about five years ago they had to remove the implants they're now putting in three others where they can leave in for longer and there is some residual vision there was a, an implant called argus which uh was licensed initially to be put in and quite a number were put in the united states and, and europe but then that was discontinued due to some issues and that hasn't restarted again so there's some progress um and in, in, oh, sorry sorry mike in, in particular um uh, they're, they're working at sort of ways of improving things like um, power sources for the devices. So actually powering them with light or infrared radiation rather than requiring things like battery packs. As John mentioned, the problem is, is that a, c a couple of the companies sort of folded their devices in effect, the Argus 2 and another one, the Retina AG implant, because the uptake, even though they achieved regulatory approval, was, was relatively poor um in in countries in which they were approved and and the last uh, question i've got here is um are there any updates on lca uh nmnat1 nmnat1 i know it's ongoing i know there's um clinical trials ongoing i know that the the mouse studies were very, very promising um, and a uh, clinical trial is underway as far as I'm aware. I'm not sure that it's been reported um, on as yet, but I think, I think again, that's a promising one. Right. Oh, a couple more have snuck in while I wasn't watching. 
Um, is there any work happening in optic nerve hy uh, hypertrophy or neuropathy? Um, in brackets, not sure of the correct terminology, close brackets. They could be referring to Labus hereditary optic neuropathy. There was a, a gene replacement study for that, which uh, had equivocal results as another study ongoing at present. And that was being conducted. We had some Australian patients who were about to be enrolled in the first one, then it closed its enrollment before they could take part. But uh, apart from that, uh, there, there's still, uh, there, there's a lot of preclinical work going on in those areas. And two, two last questions I'll ask, um, and anything else we'll send to you through the, the back channel and publish out. Are there any known genetic trials for ocular albinism? Hmm, not sure of any genetic trials that I know of. Um, I was just looking up something here about L-DOPA. Mm -hmm. um, so there's something on clinicaltrials.gov about L-DOPA in albinism. So... Um, yeah, we'd have to look into that a bit more for the for whoever's making that um, that inquiry. So they should reach out. And, and the final question: um, Will genetics testing resume through hospitals by the end of this year? I work with families who've had it postponed, understandably due to COVID. Um, that should certainly be the case. Um, we're actually doing um, some of our consultations um, through telehealth. Um, video video health actually um but it, it it kind of it depends on the the setup and so on and that's not always possible um and also for the genetic testing we often um like that um people patients have uh their full ophthalmic diagnosis sorted out because um if we don't have the correct ophthalmic um diagnosis and information then then genetic testing can sometimes be a bit misleading actually um so it, it can be a little bit delayed uh, with covid because of you know needing this combination of the ophthalmic information um to go with the genetic information but yeah. i'm sure i'm sure as soon as covid settles <laughs> that'll all be up and running again yeah, I think um, I think it's more us that are the delay. Where I think the genetics, as Robin was saying, the genetics is still happening by clinical um, telehealth. But yeah, it'll all get going. It is actually get going slowly. So as soon as we're back to normal in the rest of the world, so will that. Fantastic. Great. Um, and unless Professor Grigg, unless there's anything else you'd like to throw in, I, I just I just see uh, one question at the end of the chat there. I think. It, important to understand there is significant uh, a collaboration across the country so and each state really in there has a sort of a center for uh, genetic eye disease or inherited retinal diseases and there's clinical trial sites basically certainly running at present through Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and Perth and so it, it is a collaborative environment for this type of work clinical care and research across the country. Fantastic oh Thank you, the four of you, for your time today. Very much appreciated. Um, this is the point bef before I um, pass to Professor Grigg to make a few closing remarks. Where I'll just explain to everybody, um, we are going to wrap up our main session now and have some closing remarks to just say thanks to everyone for coming. We are then going to go into our breakout sessions. There's a breakout session for parents and adults with VI um, about advocacy in the NDIS. There's a breakout session uh, focused around teachers and provisions for students for NESA, and there's a breakout session for young people living with VI. Um, we won't reconvene at the end of those sessions. So effectively, this, this will be the, the close and the thank you for everybody. Uh, but please don't forget those sessions are there, and please do come and join. Um, over to you. Look, I'd like to thank everybody for their participation today. It's been a fantastic uh, session so far. I'd particularly like to though, sort of offer my thanks and uh, to all the work that's gone in behind the scenes and to Michael, who's been the face of this presenting and hosting. This has been a, a pretty intense uh, position handling all the queries and questions that come along. So thank you very much, Michael. It's been a great pleasure to have your enthusiasm and expertise in running this. I'd really like to thank the Safe Site team of Janet Bunn, Emma Coleman, Bryony Glastonbury, who really spent a lot of time in organising this. I'd like to thank Lorraine Villarant, who's our patient care coordinator, who's provided really some 
the links between a lot of people. And then just finally to thank all our speakers today, our special guests, our panelists. It's been a really wonderful time and thank all my colleagues. So enjoy the last session and uh, we look forward to hopefully seeing you in person next year.